Live from Bryant Denny Stadium with special guests, feature stories, and a comprehensive look at Alabama's upcoming game. This is Crimson Tide Kickoff on WVUA 23. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. Happy game day. I'm Gary Harris, and you're watching Crimson Tide Kickoff. We are going to get you ready to go for this huge game this afternoon between Alabama and Ole Miss. Alabama ranked number one. Ole Miss comes in number 12, and the Rebels have designs on shocking the world by upsetting the top-ranked Crimson Tide. It's going to be a fun hour right here on WVUA 23 live from inside our studios inside Bryant-Denny Stadium. And let's get you started, as always, with Bama headlines. Let's go. For the latest on the Crimson Tide, you don't need the newspaper. You need Bama headlines. The big question all week surrounding this game is the Alabama defense up to the challenge of slowing down the Ole Miss dynamic offense. If not, can the Crimson Tide keep pace with the Rebels attack again? Last year, it was crazy. Alabama and Ole Miss combined for 111 points and 1,370 yards of total offense. It was a barn burner. We had never seen a game like it in the Southeastern Conference. Alabama won it 63 to 48 over in Oxford. And this game could very well springboard one of the two quarterbacks, the Heisman Trophy favorite. Ole Miss quarterback Matt Corral is currently the betting favorite for the Heisman in Las Vegas. And Alabama's Bryce Young is second. Both have gaudy statistics heading into today's game. And the signal caller that is able to lead his team to victory this afternoon will have a lot of momentum not just from the team standpoint, but where the Heisman Trophy is concerned as well. And it's Talladega weekend. We'll tell you about a very strong Crimson Tide tie-in that is in the field for tomorrow's Yellowwood 500. Plus, interviews with Alabama women's golf coach Mick Potter. We'll take a look at a special fundraiser that combines Alabama football and one of the most popular reality TV shows that we've ever seen on reality TV. Plus, we'll talk with Brad Logan, a Mississippi sports radio and TV personality, as he covers Ole Miss in our Behind the Enemy Lines segment. Well, Lane Kiffin will try to become the first former Nick Saban assistant to defeat Coach Saban head-to-head. -head. You know the record. Saban is 23-0 against his former assistants, and Kiffin is 0-2 all-time against Saban. Now, in 2009, when he was the head coach at Tennessee, remember that? It took this block of a last-second field goal by Mount Cody, Terrence Cody, to give Alabama a 16-13 win. And that preserved Alabama's perfect season. Alabama went on to win the national championship that year. More recently, Kiffin was Alabama's offensive coordinator from 2014 to 2016. Now he's the head coach of the Rebels. He's been very complimentary of this year's Alabama team. That continued this morning when the Ole Miss head coach spoke with ESPN's Laura Rutledge on College Game Day. What would it mean for your program if you're able to upset the number one team in the country and a Nick Saban coach team that you know all about that dynasty? Well, I mean, that would take a lot of work. We'd have to play awesome. You got to get some breaks, you know, and anytime you play the number one team on the road. And so maybe little Ole Miss can pull it off. Did you say little Ole Miss? I did. And that's just, you know, you copy people when it's worked. And Dabo did it and they won. So <laughs> maybe it'll work. He's calling his inner Dabo now. Kiffin pulling out all the tricks to try to get this upset win today in Tuscaloosa. Well, there's an expression that you've heard for years on SportsCenter, on ESPN. You can't stop him. You can only hope to contain him. Now, that might sum up the challenge in front of Alabama's defense today in terms of stopping the Rebels. Through the first three games, Ole Miss is averaging 52 points and a whopping 600 50-plus yards of total offense per game. That leads the nation and is 170 yards more than Alabama's average. And Alabama's not a weakling when it comes to offensive football. But this Ole Miss offense, well, it right now is running at a level that nobody else in the country is running at. You know, definitely they harp on it. It wasn't the game that they wanted. It wasn't the kind of performance on defense that they wanted. Um, you know, so this week has been a huge harp on um, executing what we have to do. You know, Ole Miss is a great team. They do great things on offense, um, and it's a huge challenge for us. They're a great team. They have a, almost their whole entire team returned, except for about two offensive players. So they have the experience and the um, discipline to be great. And it's SEC football, so it don't get any better. It's going to be a physical and dominant game, and we, we are always excited for moments like these. 
Well, you know this much. If you're going to play an offense like Ole Miss and your defense, you want all hands on deck. Good news today. LeBron Ray, number 18, that veteran defensive end out of James Clemens High School in North Alabama, played against Southern Miss last week. He's expected to play even more this week against Ole Miss. He's been dealing with injuries his whole career, but when number 18 is in the game, he's really, really good. He could be a disruptive force. Here are some notes of interest going into the afternoon contest between the Tide and the Rebels. Alabama, how dominant has the Tide been? Well, in addition to having won 18 games in a row, they have not trailed in a game since Georgia last season when they were down at halftime. That's 53 quarters either tied or with the lead. Saban versus Kiffin, as we mentioned, 2-0. and And Saban's 23 in all-time games against his former assistants. Kiffin will give it a shot today. Alabama has six games against the SEC West, and all but one of those teams ranked in the top 25 beginning today with 12th-ranked Ole Miss. Those are some numbers that uh, will make viewing the game for you a little more easy in terms of your knowledge of what's happening this afternoon. Speaking of knowledge, the weather is always a big topic when it comes to football. Let's get our first look at our game day forecast. CTKO's Gracie Dincasa is in the weather center to give us the latest. And Gracie, I know it looks pretty out there. Is there a possibility, though, that we might have a pop-up shower or two before the game ends? Yeah, Gary, there is a chance. It's a very slight chance, though, thankfully. Exciting day for us here in Tuscaloosa, and I think the weather will cooperate with us. Let's take a live look outside of Brian Denny right now. We are seeing some clouds in the sky. Temperature of 78 right now with some breezy winds out of the south. So there is some moisture in the air, but we're looking at some nice conditions. If you see, people are already setting up shop, and that cloud coverage is going to keep our temperatures in check today. If we're looking across central Alabama, we're seeing mostly temperatures in the upper 70s. Over down here in Demopolis is 80. Some of us are seeing low 70s. Coleman and Haleyville are low 70s. They have some more cloud coverage. But for the look at our whole day today, around 3 p.m., we're only topping out in the low 80s. But like I said, there's a slight chance of some rain. So you might want to pack a poncho or an umbrella with you. But I think we'll be stay dry for most of the day. I'll have a closer look at your game day forecast coming up in just a few minutes. Gary? Thank you, Gracie, and I'm keeping my fingers crossed that those showers do not pop up during the game. It's a pretty day, though. It's a football day. It's October. We got Bama and Ole Miss. What else do you need? Well, coming up, Alabama football and basketball. Big recruiting news this past week. We will talk about uh, how the Tide strengthen its future programs on both the hardwood and on the gridiron. Plus, we'll go behind enemy lines and talk to Mississippi sports personality Brad Logan for a closer look at the Ole Miss Rebels and the opportunity in front of them today. Can the lane train do something that has never been done? And that's beat Nick Saban after you coach for him. And later on, we'll hear from Alabama women's golf coach Mick Potter on the fast start to the fall season, which has pushed his team's expectations sky high. Stick around. We'll be right back with more Crimson Tide kickoff only on WVUA 23. You're watching Crimson Tide kickoff on WVUA 23. University Alabama. <laughs> How was Alabama able to win you over? Um, I say mainly because like the coaches from the players to like the environment is so it like stood out amongst like all of the schools that I've been to. No school could show me rings on rings on, on rings. Nick Saban is the Lord of the Rings. And that matters. Welcome back into Crimson Tide Kickoff. I'm Gary Harris. That was Columbus Carver, Georgia four star offensive tackle Elijah Pridgett. He committed to Alabama this past Tuesday live on CBS Sports HQ, announcing his decision to play football and attend the University of Alabama. Now, the six foot six, 290 pound Pridgett is one of the elite tackle prospects in the 2022 class. He's got it all long arms, athletic, quick feet. He chose Alabama over Florida State. Georgia and Southern California. He made his official visit back in June and then was back on campus this month for Alabama's game against Mercer. That's when he told Nick Saban he wanted to be a part of the Lord of the Rings experience at Alabama. It's another huge addition for the 2022 recruiting class, which now has 15 commitments. Look at that kid. I mean, he is, if you drew up an offensive tackle, I think you might draw up Elijah Pritchett. He's just got the look. Well, Ole Miss comes into this afternoon's game with one of the best teams that they've had probably, well, no doubt, since those great Hugh Freeze teams that were able to beat Alabama back to back in 2014 and 2015. And also, the Rebels have the current Heisman Trophy favorite in quarterback Matt Corral. For more on Ole Miss 
Here's CTKO's Matthew Travis, who went behind enemy lines as he spoke with Mississippi radio personality and television sportscaster Brad Logan to get an inside look at the Rebels. Alabama and Ole Miss come into today's game both having a quarterback at the top of the Heisman Award watch list in Bryce Young for the Tide and Matt Corral for the Rebels. But when I spoke to Brad Logan, host of the Brad Logan Show, he told me Corral's leadership both on and off the field is going to play a huge factor. Well, I think more than anything is this year's Matt Corral is a more of a veteran. He's had a couple of years to learn the system of Lane Kiffin. I think more than anything, he's uh, he's been a leader both on and off the field. We had a chance to meet with Matt Corral uh, on Monday, and he seemed to be much more comfortable than he has been in the past. And I think that says a lot about his comfortability about the system in and of itself. While Ole Miss has a fantastic quarterback in Matt Corral, one component of their offense that is often overlooked is their running game, which against this Alabama defense might be a deciding factor in today's game. So while people kind of get caught up in what Matt Corral can do, I think it would be you know foolish for people to, to forget this Ole Miss running attack has been really good this year, and it's been even better than it has last year. So I think you'll see a very balanced offense on Saturday uh, between running the football and throwing the football for the Rebels. Last year when Alabama and Ole Miss faced off, Alabama came away with the win in what was a high-scoring affair. But Logan says the Rebels aren't worried about the past. They're not worried about the future. They're simply focusing on the game at hand. But this is a team that doesn't look at history. A, a team like Ole Miss doesn't look at the numbers. We heard Matt Corral say that when people ask him about the Heisman Trophy, he kind of puts it aside because he doesn't care about the Heisman Trophy, Alabama stats or anything. He cares about the next game. So this seems very, very laser focused on Alabama. Logan also told me that this game is very important to Lane Kiffin. Everyone knows about Nick Saban's undefeated record against his former assistants. And Logan says Kiffin wants to be the one to end it. Reporting for Crimson Tide Kickoff, I'm Matthew Travis. Thank you, Matthew. Great update. I've said it before. I love behind enemy lines. All right, we told you we had some basketball recruiting news. Alabama got its first commitment of the 2022 recruiting cycle this past week. Point guard Jaden Bradley announced his decision to join Alabama. He's out of famed IMG Academy in Bradenton, Florida, and he's not just any commit. He's rated by ESPN as the top point guard in the country. 6'3", he chose Alabama over four other heavyweight finalists. Check this out. Kentucky, Arizona, Gonzaga, and Florida State. The senior point guard cut his list of finalists earlier this year, and then he ended visited Tuscaloosa and Coach Nate Oates and the staff the weekend of July 11. Obviously, it went well. This is big time for Alabama. This kid can play. And baseball recruiting news. Former Hillcrest High School and current Shelton State infielder Walt Bailey, number 11 in this video from Shelton, has committed to the University of Alabama. Bailey, who has one more year of eligibility remaining at Shelton, batted 388 this past season with eight home runs and 48 runs batted in. He can swing the stick now. He played mainly first base for the Bucks. But Alabama likes him as a corner infield. He's going to play uh, some at third for Shelton and could play first and third for the Crimson Tide as well when he gets to UA. Nice pickup for Brad Bohannon and company. Well, when we return on CTKO, we'll go around the SEC to take a look at the other matchups in the Southeastern Conference on this football Saturday, including a clash of color schemes. That's a nice tease. Also, a former Alabama super fan used the power of the printed word to perfection. We'll explain. Keep it tuned in to CTKO. Welcome back to Crimson Tide Kickoff, live inside our WVUA 23 studios, located inside Bryant Denny Stadium. I'm Gary Harris. Well, based on the latest college football playoff predictor, the SEC has an 80% chance of getting multiple teams into this year's college football playoff. Wow, if that happens, it would be the second time the SEC got two teams in the four-team playoff. Remember, Alabama and Georgia both made it, played in the championship game. Which SEC team has the best opportunity to help its cause today? Here's CTKO's Jack Hutchins going around the SEC. In today's day and age, with social media being in the forefront of everyone's life, maturity must be taken into account because people can see exactly what you're saying in the blink of an eye. Teams want to stay away from making billboard materials for their rivals that provide as much needed motivation. Dan Mullen did not accomplish that task. Wandale Robinson is averaging 16 yards per reception and has two touchdowns on the year, but Mullen wouldn't know that. 
This is the type of thing that coaches should know when watching film, especially when the opponent's player is their leading receiver. And then uh, Wandale Robinson specifically, what, what is he doing for them? Which one? What number? Scott. I know numbers, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> He's number one. I gotcha. We'll see if Wandale Robinson can make a memorable impression on Mullen and the Gators. Tyon Evans is excited for today's match against Missouri. Maybe a little too excited. Earlier this week, Evans spoke with the media and said he's learned from some of the maturity issues from his past and credits his family with playing a big part in his growth. He may still have more growing to do. Listen to what Tyon Evans said about facing the Missouri Tigers defense. It's going to have some fun, most definitely. <laughs> all right. That's all I'm going to say. We're going to have fun. Don't think Eli Drinkwitz and the Tigers haven't heard that answer and won't use it as big-time billboard motivation for today's game. Battle the Maroons in College Station with Mississippi State versus Texas A&M. Every time fans watch the game, they are stunned at how these massive two universities can choose such similar colors, with the Bulldogs' color code of maroon only being slightly lighter than the Aggies. But on TV, it can truly be hard to tell who is who on the field with the similarities. Besides the color schemes, the Aggies are having to scheme against the air raid after a tough loss to Arkansas last week. And Mississippi State is looking to bounce back after a loss to the Tigers of Louisiana State. Have fun watching the games. For Crimson Tide Kickoff and around the SEC, I'm Jack Hutchins. Thank you, Jack. Jack's throwing some shade, maroon shade, on both A&M and Mississippi State. How about that? All right, Texas A&M uh, lost to Arkansas, and Arkansas made a huge jump. Eight spots in the polls. They take on second-ranked Georgia. That game is already underway. That's going to be a doozy over in Athens. It's the first time that uh, Arkansas has played in a top-10 matchup in over 50 years. Listen to this stat. A&M's defense has allowed the fewest number of pass completions among all FBS teams. The Aggies opponent Mississippi State has completed more passes than any other team in the nation this season. Something's got to give there. What about tonight? Auburn and LSU kicking off down in Death Valley at 8 p.m. The last time Auburn won at LSU's Tiger Stadium was 1999. Remember Tommy Tuberville, now a U.S. Senator, was the head coach. They broke out the Stogies on the playing field. It really ticked LSU off, so much so that they refused to lose to Auburn anymore in Death Valley. But that would be a heck of a ball game tonight and a great SEC schedule. Hey, Vandy's got a chance to get a win. They're a 14.5 point favorite over UConn. How bad is UConn? They're a 14.5 point underdog against Vandy. That tells you that. All right, welcome back uh, with uh, more CTKO. Fan attendance is always a big topic of conversation on game days, but staying for 60 minutes was never a question for super fan Hannah Stevens. She's all in. CTKO's Tatum Vaught has more on the UA sign girl who left a mark on the Alabama student section that won't ever be forgotten. How do you make your words count? Painting them on a giant sign for the whole world to see is what gave Hannah Stevens her voice in the college football world. I wasn't really sure what people were going to think because, you know, at that point there wasn't really that many crazy fans in Bryant Diddy Stadium. And so it all started uh, my freshman year, painted, painted my face, and then from there it just kind of escalated. Stevens, otherwise known as UA Sign Girl, never intended on being in the spotlight. She was born into the Crimson Tide fandom and has always had a naturally spirited personality. So in 2013, when one of our signs blew up during the Alabama-Tennessee game, she quickly transitioned into a super fan that others looked up to. It doesn't surprise me that, you know, she has a positive effect, you know, on people in that regard because, uh, you know, that kind of energy is something that is contagious. People like to hang around people like that. So uh, I, I'm a huge Hannah Stevens fan. Stevens' dedication to the Tide in the stands helped her future career as a sports journalist as well. You know, there are just so many doors that were open because I was a UA Sun girl that, you know, the, like the Lord used to help guide me down this path. Cause I never, I never would have thought, oh, I'm going to be someone, a mega fan, but I also never realized how much that would change my life for the better. Stevens became a student at the University of Alabama in 2010, one year after Alabama football won its first national championship of the Nick Saban era. She says if a student wanted a lower bowl seat, they had to line up two to three hours before kickoff. For Hannah to be sure she had a seat in the front row, she was in line 24 hours before the game. 
camping outside of Bryant Denny Stadium the night before. Now that is what you call a super fan. For Crimson Tide Kickoff, I'm Tatum Vaught. Back to you, Gary. Thank you, Tatum. So you think you're a fan, right? Well, maybe you're not as big a fan as you think you are. Hannah Stevens has a different sign for every Alabama football game. Probably the one that got the most attention was 2013 for the game against Tennessee, which said, quote, Coach Saban, we'll stay for 60 minutes if you stay forever. It refers to Alabama student section staying for the full game rather than leaving early. This sign is one that Stevens held on to. She had it framed, and it's hanging up at her parents' home today. How about that? Things you only find out on CTKO. Well, coming up, we have an interview with Alabama women's golf coach Mick Potter, national champion head coach, and we'll get the inside scoop on the talented Alabama women's golf roster. Also, highlights from last night. Find out if Alabama soccer was able to score a top 25 win or win over a top 25 team. We'll have the answer for you when we return to CTKO. Alabama soccer with an opportunity to do something last night that they hadn't done since last November. Beat a top 25 team, and they did it. Reina Reyes scored the only goal of the match in the 84th minute. It's her second game-winning goal of the season. And as I mentioned, soccer's first win over top 25 time team this year as they beat LSU one to nothing. Next up, the Crimson Tide travels to Fayetteville, Arkansas, next week to face the eighth-ranked Razorbacks. Maybe they'll knock off a top 10 team. That would be pretty cool. And welcome back into Crimson Tide Kickoff. I'm Gary Harris. The start for Alabama women's golf has not disappointed this fall. Last weekend, the Crimson Tide finished second at the prestigious Mason Rudolph Championship with a team score of 18 under par. That's the team's lowest score in a regular season tournament since 2018. CTKO Stu McCann spoke with women's head golf coach Mick Potter about the strong start and expectations for this Alabama women's golf team. Thanks, Gary. Alabama women's golf followed up a fourth place finish in its season opening tournament by taking second place last weekend at the Mason Rudolph Championship in Franklin, Tennessee. Not too bad. I'm joined by Tide head coach Mick Potter. Coach, what impressed you the most from both of those matches early on? Well, the, the finish at the Annika, I mean, that, that's the kind of field where if you're wanting to get into the match play portion of the national championship, uh, at the end of the year, they are the teams that you're going to have to compete with. So to finish fourth in that field, they are the best teams in the country. So that performance was really strong. And then um, to shoot 13 under at, at the Mason Rudolph uh, or scores we haven't produced in a couple of years. Now, I'm not surprised. Uh, I think we have a lot of a lot of quality players that have had a lot of success that know how to how to shoot low scores and we're getting a lot of production out of all five spots and that is one thing a lot of stuff in the preseason but i did hear you say this team has immense talent you cannot dispute that but that also means that the team has an immense opportunity the expectations you are bigger and higher expectations for yourself inside that locker room than anywhere else, simply based on you know the potential this team has, but how do you realize that potential and make good on it? Absolutely, and you know, so they all have to look at it in terms of they all want to play golf after college, and now is the time you lay the foundation and build that, that framework for being able to compete on a professional level afterwards. So every day is really important. And every shot you hit in competition is really important. And, you know, for us, we did a lot of good things last year on the golf course. We just tended to offset those with some big glaring mistakes. So our ability to eliminate doubles, triples, quads, um, and to take it, make a lot of pars, avoid, avoid bogeys as much as possible, take advantage of our birdies and make them count. It's been a, a real big key this year. I mean, we have managed ourselves so much better, and they've done a great job on, on being attentive to what uh, their intention is and, and improving every day. 
Anyone who has followed women's golf the past few years knows what Kenzie Wright meant to the program, the leadership and the other intangibles that she provided as one of those veterans. Now, what was the player's reaction when Kenzie goes out and wins her pro debut, the Texas Open in June? She has such a strong recent connection to the team. It probably felt like from the player's perspective, it wasn't oh. Kenzie, it was one of us that did that and went out and won. Yeah, it's, um, she was always right on the, the edge of winning college tournaments. Uh, she had a number of second place finishes, and I know it was disappointing that she didn't uh, win in college. But you know, when you're playing for your paycheck, it, it absolutely is is most important that you perform there. Um, you know, Kenzie, when she came to us, she transferred from SMU, had an immediate impact. She had an, uh, with her scores, but also in leadership and. Um, kind of bringing the younger players along. And I, we're just really grateful she came back for her, her COVID year. Uh, you know, Susan, our assistant coach, Susan Rosensteel and myself take a lot of credit for that win because in between the time we played our last tournament at the NCAA championships and Kenzie going home permanently, we played a match where Susan and I play our scramble. Uh, we each hit a shot and we play from the best one against Kenzie. And she really thought she was going to beat us but um, we pretty much dominated her. We've never been beaten. And, um, you know, I think it motivated her on for, for bigger and better things. Thank you, Coach Potter. Alabama Women's Golf is back in action next weekend at the Tar Heel Invitational in North Carolina. Stay tuned to WVUA 23 and to stay up to date on all of the women's golf highlights. For CTKO, I'm Stu McCann. Let's go back to Gary. Thank you, Stu. Mick Potter is a great coach and a terrific guy, and uh, good to see women's golf rolling again. Well, NASCAR's Cup Series, the playoffs are underway, and we got a playoff race at Talladega Super Speedway this weekend. Sunday's Yellowwood 500 is scheduled for 1 p.m. on NBC, and Hendrick Motorsports driver Alex Bowman has never won at Talladega. He has finished second, but the driver of the number 48, formerly driven by Jimmy Johnson, has a strong connection to the Talladega Super Speedway, more specifically to the Alabama football program. The late Rowdy Harrell, former Bama football player, was on Bowman's Pitman, pit crew in the past. The former Hill County star and Crimson Tide player died in November 2020 while on his honeymoon with his wife, Blakely, tragically. Harrell and his wife were, as I said, in a fatal car wreck. After he was done at Alabama, Harrell got a job on the Hendrick Motorsports race team. He was part of the number 88 crew for Dell Jr. when Alex Bowman replaced Dell Jr. in the 88. He was uh, working with Bowman. Big shoes to fill, but Bowman filled them for Earnhardt Jr. and now for Jimmy Johnson. The driver said Harrell was one of the first people to reach out with support when he got that job. This weekend will be the second race at Talladega since the accident that killed Harrell and his wife, Blakely. It was rough. You know, he was a big personality and, um, you know, it was a, a big loss for our team and, and horrible for for his family and her family, um, it was a, a terrible thing. So, you know, going back to Talladega is uh, definitely pretty emotional. It was the first race there, and I'm sure it will be again. Well, this past April, Bowman picked up his third career Sprint Cup win, his first on a short track at Richmond, and he dedicated the victory to Rowdy and Blakely. It was a touching moment. Tomorrow's Yellowwood 500 is the third race out of 10 in the Sprint Cup Chase playoffs. Bowman is looking to pick up some momentum. He's currently 11th. He's got to try to make the cut down to the final eight with just a couple races left before they cut it down. The 48 car finished 26th and 22nd, respectively, in the first uh, couple of playoff races, but looking to pick up momentum. Bowman will have Rowdy and Blakely on his mind, and I guarantee you the family really appreciates Alex Bowman uh, and his support. That is a great, great uh, young man, and uh, like I said, to dedicate a race, that you won and have that moment was really, really special. Well, coming up on CTKO, find out the connection between the reality TV series American Chopper and Alabama football. You want to stay tuned for that. And what are the keys to today's game in the opinion of a couple former players that used to be part of these types of matchups? We'll have the perspective from the host of the SEC show, SEC Nation. How about that? Stick around. We'll back after this. 
And welcome back to Crimson Tide kickoff ahead of this Saturday afternoon's game between Alabama and Ole Miss. And always a lot of special attractions for an Alabama football game, as we know. But there is one in particular uh, this week that's really special. And joining me is Paul Tuttle Sr. to talk about it. Of course, you know him from American Chopper, the hit uh, Discovery Television series from 2002 to 2010. There have been a couple of spinoff series. And uh, he's become an international celebrity. And his custom bikes are in demand. But he's also helped people with these bikes and wounded warriors and, and veterans and things like that. And there's a bike that we're going to be giving away here in a couple of weeks here in Alabama to help the family of Braxton Wideman, a little nine-year-old boy in Birmingham that's fighting for his life. You might have seen his story last fall on ESPN in a Tom Rinaldi piece, but there is a bike that... Um, is going to be donated, has been donated for giveaway. And uh, Paul joins us to talk about it. Good morning, Paul. How are you? Good. How are you guys doing? Doing great. Uh, give us some insight into how this fundraiser came about. It came through a customer of yours, a friend of yours, that wanted to do something special yeah. for Braxton and his family. A friend of mine, um, Bill and Kim uh, Grill, uh, their son uh, goes to the school down there, and uh, you know he started getting involved in the charity and, uh, you, you know, they're, they're good friends of mine. And, uh, you know, they asked me if I could uh, participate in this. And, you know, uh, I was more than, than glad to. And uh, that's how uh, pretty much that came about. Tell us more about this bike. It's been on display all week at, uh, at T-Town Harley in Tuscaloosa, and it's also here on campus today. This bike that people have an opportunity to buy tickets for for a chance to win with all the proceeds going to Braxton and his family. Tell us more about this bike, if you would, Paul. Well, the bike, uh, the bike is uh, actually uh, Bill uh, went searching for one of our older uh, bikes that we built uh, a while ago. It's a bike that we built, I think, in 2000. Eight, but they were a um, they were they were like a production bike, and so there was there was I don't I don't know how he wound up getting that bike, so it was a little bit different than the, the, the choppers that we build. So I don't know how he found that bike, but it was a cool bike, uh, and I think uh, in particular uh, this bike has uh, everybody's signature on the oil tank, so that's probably one of uh, one. Um, and you know, it's just a cool looking bike. It's a, it's, it's, it's a very rideable bike. Everything is pretty much handmade on it. Uh, fenders, tanks. Uh, so there was a lot of, uh, thought, uh, put into the bike. As I said, it's been at T-Town Harley, Harley this week. We're looking at video of it right now. It's absolutely gorgeous. And I know folks want an opportunity to win this gorgeous machine and also want to help, uh, Braxton Wyman and his family. How do they do it, Paul? Uh, they need to go to Braxton, uh, bikeforbraxton.com. Mm -hmm. Bikeforbraxton.com. When there, yes. you can purchase your tickets. Or you can also, if you don't have an interest in, in winning the bike, you can still donate. 100% of the proceeds go to Braxton and his family, correct? Yes. Okay. So that's that's the bottom line. It's, it's helping some people. Uh, we've still got an opportunity a couple more weeks before this bike is going to be given away, before the drawing for it, right? Yeah, yes. Yeah, till the 16th of October. Yeah, so you still got time, folks, to get to bikeforbraxton.com. I mean, it's a beautiful machine, and it's a great cause, and we want to help Braxton. He is a, he's a little hero. He has fought courageously through this. He's kept his head up. His family has battled with him, but financially, you can imagine it's taking a toll on the family, so please go to bikeforbraxton.com and, and buy a ticket or donate to this family, but this opportunity to win this bike, it is that's the thing about all your bikes, Paul. Literally, every one of them are one of a kind. Thank you. Can I ask you while I've got you, uh, post-American Chopper, uh, you know, what exactly are you doing now? I know you've got, a, you've got a restaurant. Can you catch us up on, on exactly what all is going on in your life right now? Yeah, like I said, we just opened up a restaurant in Florida. We still have a place uh, in New York, so we go back and forth two weeks uh, here and two weeks there. But I also opened up a, uh, a bike shop down there, so I'm building, still building bikes down there. And, and you know, my career before uh, building bikes is I had a steel fabrication business, so... You know, I've always dabbled in welding and steel. Yeah, you're, you're good at it, no doubt. What about um, the celebrity? How, how have you, I know that's not why you started building motorcycles, but it became part of it. How have you handled and dealt with that? Has it been difficult or is it something that you've enjoyed? 
Being a celebrity? Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it, it's good. You know, you know why it's good because I have opportunities to do uh, what I'm doing now. You That's know, right. and I think that you know, uh, giving back is you know is really what it's all about, making a difference. And finally, Little Braxton's a huge Alabama football fan. We're tying in this giveaway with Alabama football to get it um, to get it some publicity. Have you started following the Crimson Tide at all? No, no, no. <laughs> not not a big no, football no. fan. We we won't tell Nick Saban, Paul. How about that? Okay. Hey, yeah, listen, it's our secret. We appreciate your time, and again, we'll uh, we'll continue to promote that uh, giveaway here in Tuscaloosa for Brandon for Braxton Whiteman and his family, and we appreciate your time. Okay. Thanks, Ben. I appreciate you. All right, thank you, Paul. We'll be right back with more Crimson Tide kickoff right after this. I'm Gary Harris. Welcome back to CTKO. Well, it's the first SEC meeting between the two quarterbacks today, Bryce Young and Matt Corral, the two Heisman frontrunners, but they've met up before. In fact, Young and Cor Coral, uh, Corral were both high school quarterbacks training together in Southern California before heading to the Southeastern Conference. Now, Young spoke on his relationship with Corral ahead of their first head-to-head -head matchup coming up this afternoon. And uh, those guys uh, really are fans of each other and uh, excited to be having an opportunity to play against each other uh, in this game coming up today. Well, not only are fans from both Alabama and Ole Miss excited for today's matchup between the Tide and the Rebels, but the media has had quite a field day with all of the storylines leading up to the highly anticipated game. CTK reporter Dylan Morgan has the full story. All eyes will be on Alabama as they get ready to take on the number 12 ranked Ole Miss Rebels in the Tide's biggest game of the season so far. This includes SEC Nation, which apparently has had this game circled since last year's barn burner in Oxford. I can't wait. Uh, I mean, this game, I had this game earmarked from last year after seeing what Ole Miss was able to do against this defense. And, you know, there was question marks going into the year about how good Alabama was going to be. I think we realized that they're pretty darn good, but Ole Miss to me has the best quarterback in the entire country. I think they have the most creative play designer uh, in Lane Kiff, and I think they have one of the best play callers in Jeff Levy, the offensive coordinator. So, look, there's going to be fireworks. They're going to put up a lot of points, I believe, um, and I think that's the way this game's going to go. It's going to come down to a few explosive plays, a few turnovers maybe. A turnover may may sway the tide one way or another. No pun intended there, Rome, but uh, I think it's going to be a good one. And with all the hype around these two high-powered offenses, one former Tide player believes that another factor will ultimately affect the outcome of the ball game. I think Alabama's defense is just is is better overall. I think Ole Miss's defense is probably the most improved, so they're they're feeling more confident about what they're doing. It's all about. But I don't I don't know which one has the edge in this game though. It's going to be the team that can force the most turnovers or get the most stops. This is all about a possession game. It's all about creating possessions for your own team. If we can take the ball over, we can create a punt. That is a win as a win as a win. Uh, and it, those are the only wins that you really get to count in this game if you're a defense. How many third down stops? How many times can I actually force a turnover? If I'm doing that, then I give myself a chance to win. So there you have it. Will it be the California gunslinging quarterbacks or the stingy defenses that will propel their team to victory today? Be sure to tune in and to find out with kickoff set for 2.30 p.m. Central Time from right here inside of Bryant-Denny Stadium. Reporting for CTKO, I'm Dylan Morgan. Thanks, Dylan. More CTKO right after this. Welcome back to CTKO. I am Mike Royer, and on this game day, we're excited to have the chancellor of the University of Alabama system, and that is Finest St. John. Mr. St. John, it's great to see you again. Thank you, Mike. Good to see you. After all, everyone, including all three campuses, have been through in the last year and a half or so, on this pretty Saturday, is there anything better than game day here in Tuscaloosa? Uh, no, sir. This has been uh, this has been a long time coming for yeah. a lot of people, and it has been a truly, you know, I, I noticed in the first two games of the season, which really weren't big competitive games for mm -hmm. for Alabama, that the crowd just seemed 
energized like I don't remember. And uh, the joy of people being back and exactly. being able to go in person has been, has been you, could, you can feel it. It's good to see 101,000 happy people together for it a is. change. That's really is. something. Um, you have to deal with all kinds of things. You want all campuses, all three campuses, to be first-class educational institutions. I suppose that is the very top priority. But we pride ourselves in great athletic athletics. How do you balance it as chancellor and as your board of trustees does? Balance where you're sure that both are getting the attention they need? Well, our mission is to educate students. Yep. Uh, and I think what we've learned and what we've realized over the years is that athletics enhances that. It doesn't compete with it. It enhances it, particularly here at the University of Alabama. I mean, people, people are dedicated and feel connected to the university a lot of a lot of times because of athletics and so that brings attention it brings support uh, it it brings goodwill and it doesn't it it doesn't detract yeah. from academics it enhances it dr bell under his leadership flirts with close to 40,000 students here on this campus. I believe I read a little over 70,000 students on all three campuses. Billions of dollars of impact. You can't take that lightly. You're charged with providing leadership over all of that. Going forward, when we see cranes on every campus building things, how do you balance, this is the demand now, we need more classrooms, more dormitories for our students, it costs a lot of money, how do you look long term and hopefully plan strategically correctly for that? Well, we try hard at it. Uh, the board, the board's position is a little different from the administrators on the campuses. You know, administrators' jobs is, is, are to look three and four, five, six years down the road. The Board of Trustees, and, and I think my job is to look 10, 20, and 25 years yeah. down the road. And that's hard to do because the population of high school students who go to college has been flat for several years in Alabama, flat nationwide, projected to even go down in the next few years. So we have to be careful to, uh, to, to try to predict who we serve. Education is changing like every other institution, uh, all kinds of institutions around the country. So we, we try to look ahead and be successful. But what we learned in this last year, and it w there was a question about it, uh, when everybody had to go home from campuses or go to part-time or remote yeah. learning, uh, the question was, is the on-campus educational experience, does it have a future? Mm -hmm. And what we learned is that students yearn and want to be on campus. They want that in-person experience, and they realize that education comes from more, just, more than just a classroom. That, and you cannot beat face-to-face -face instruction. I've taught a little bit here. I've been a student. Uh, it really helps for that professor to look you right in the eye. That's right, and it, it, it cannot be replaced by no, a computer can't. screen. One thing a chancellor can't do, and that is be in two places at one time. So you'll be at the Alabama Ole Miss game for a while, then make it up for the UAB Liberty game, and so you'll do double duty. Get, get to do both. Get to do both. Uh, that's a big day for UAB athletics. Uh, we've worked very hard to help make that come together. Uh, it's, it's an exciting time. Chancellor St. John, we know how busy you are. We appreciate your time. And it, the second time I've interviewed you, it's a pleasure talking to you always. Same here. Appreciate you. what you do for us. Thank you very yes, much, sir. Thank Good you. to have you in the studio. All right. CTKO continues. Let's go back to Gary Harris. Thank you so much, Mike. Well, Ole Miss has been looking forward to this game since that uh, loss in the shootout last year in Oxford. Running backs Jerion Ely and Snoop Connor are back for the Rebels. In last year's game, both players had at least 120 yards rushing and two touchdowns. And the biggest factor in the game for the Rebels, of course, is Heisman hopeful Matt Corral, who totaled 419 total yards last year against Alabama. There's been a history of quarterbacks having their Heisman moment at Bryant-Denny Stadium. What about Auburn's Cam Newton, Texas A&M's Johnny Menzel, and LSU's Joe Burrow all went on to win the Heisman Trophy after leading their teams to wins over the Crimson Tide in Tuscaloosa. Through three games, the Rebels are averaging 52-plus points and averaging well over 600 yards per game. We're not worried about who we're playing. We're worried about how we handle each practice individually. So, you know, we're worried about today. We're not worried about Alabama, you know, even though they are a great team and they are the best team that we're going to face this year, we're not worried about them right now. We're worried about getting up, having the best practice that we can today. And we're back to wrap up Crimson Tide kickoff right after this. 
I'm Gary Harris, and this is Crimson Tide Kickoff. The University of Alabama Adapted Athletics program got to show off its new wheelchair tennis facility on Friday. So cool. WVOA 23 and Crimson Tide Kickoff videographer Keith Dobbins was on site getting a first-hand look at the new Parker Hahn tennis facility. The 3,800 square foot space houses locker rooms, restrooms, a trainer's room, and offices for the coaching staff. Adapted Athletics Associate Director Margaret Stryan on what this means, she believes the support that Adapted Athletics gets here at Alabama is unlike anywhere else in the country. So yeah, I mean, you know, it's real easy for any university to say, well, we support Adapted Athletics, we support diversity. But at Alabama, you see that support. It's tangible, it's with our donors, it's with our administration, and it's with the interest that we have from our student athletes. It's, it's like no other place. Awesome program. All right, let's get a final check on the forecast with Gracie. And Gracie, now, I saw that rain over in Mississippi. Tell me that's going to stay away from Bryant Day Stadium this hey, afternoon. Hey, we're crossing our fingers. I don't think it's going to impact us much. Look how many more people are out here just in the last hour getting excited for the football team to make their way into the stadium. Let's look at the satellite and radar, though. Most of us here in Central Alabama are dry. Now, like Gary said, there is some rain over here in Mississippi, but I think most of that will dissipate. Maybe some of our western counties are seeing a few showers and storms, but if it does occur, it'll be quickly moving through, not bringing too much rain. And if we take a closer look at the game day forecast, if you're tailgating, temperatures will be around in the low 80s. And that's it for your game day forecast, Gary. Thank you, Gracie. Can't wait. Yeah, that Walk of Champions is coming up, oh, in about 30 minutes. It's going to be fun. That's going to do it for Crimson Tide kickoff. Enjoy the game, everybody. Roll Tide.